Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Daniel Freed. Hello, chaps. This will be our end of the year podcast. It'll be shorter than, than usual. Um, we'll do a bit of chat about the hour record, which has had a resurgence of interest. And uh, then we'll do a sort of look, little look back on the year. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. Lionel, I think you've got an announcement about the hour record. You're, you've just confirmed this morning you're going to have a go at it as well. Uh, no, I'm doing the two hour record. Um, I'm aiming for 50 kilometres in two hours. When's that going to be, Lionel? <laughs> Uh, once my uh, extended winter break from cycling has, um, has uh, ended and I've worked off the Christmas weight, which will be in about March. That will be a great way of working <laughs> off the Christmas weight. Um, well, we're, we're going to have our Christmas lunch today, uh, aren't we? We're going to join a few, a couple of fellow scribes and have a bit of a, a Christmas lunch. So where are we, Lionel? Uh, we are outside El Pirata, um, which is a tapas restaurant on Down Street in uh, not far from Green Park, Mayfair, I suppose, aren't not, we? Not Il Parata, is it? Not Il Parata, no. I have definitely heard um, Claudia Chiapucci erroneously referred to by certain English-speaking commentators, El Pirato, which is correct on no score whatsoever. It's not, it's not the correct Spanish word, it's not the correct Italian word, and it's not the correct writer. Is he not El Diablo? Was that, yes, that he right? was El yeah. Diablo. Yeah. Was, uh, was that the same comedy that called uh, Pantani La Diablo? Probably, yeah. <laughs> Probably. Not really. Uh, right, so listen, let's just do the first little bit of this short podcast uh, talking about the hour record. Um, I have been today uh, seeing Alex Dowsett, who announced that he's going to go for the hour record on February the 27th. Also this week, Jack Bobridge and Rohan Dennis are also going for their record in February before him, so it raises the stakes a little bit. He did say that was going to likely make it a little bit more difficult. Um, it's, that's going to be interesting, out, out of the three of those, all very strong time trialists. Jack Bobridge, very strange career. He's sort of stepped back a couple of levels. Um, Alex Dowsett announcing his hour record, which is also... He's also very motivated by the raising awareness and money for haemophiliacs. He's a haemophiliac himself. And um, they, they've got the, the Movistar team have got right behind it. They've talked a lot about um, the fact that Miguel Indurain, in a previous incarnation of Movistar, Bonesto, 20 years ago set the hour record. So there's a bit of a heritage there in that team. Um, who's going to have it by the end of February, Lionel, out of those three? Oh, that's a tricky question because Alex Dowsett's doing his on the 27th of February uh, at the Revolution meeting. A good idea to incorporate the hour record as part of an existing track meeting. That means the velodrome will be uh, full, hopefully for the hour record, and then they'll have a, a, a track meeting after that. So it's a good way of doing it, making it into an event rather than... In the 90s, I think quite a few of the hour records were held in velodromes that were, were um, basically empty, weren't they? It was, wasn't exactly a spectator friendly event I don't think um, who's going to hold it it's going to be difficult uh, for difficult to say I think it's easier to say that by the end of June Bradley Wiggins will hold it and all of this is kind of shadow boxing leading up to that point that we all anticipate happening oh doubt it won't like that I mean yeah you would fancy that Bradley Wiggins will have it what will the distance be at the end of February Oh, are you ignoring me just because this is track racing, straight speaking? I didn't think you'd have, have much. Uh, you do actually have a few things. I mean, Daniel, the, defini- the author of one of the definitive biographies of Eddie Merckx, you covered the record quite a lot on that, yeah. of course. Oh, yeah, I'm an expert. Um, I think... Who's the third guy? Bob Ridge and... Rohan oh, Dennis. Rohan Dennis. I'm not really sure about Rohan Dennis's pedigree. Um, in Long time job, long efforts like that. Um here is our, one of our esteemed colleagues, um, David Luxton, who um, is not going to be allowed to interrupt this podcast. Um, I, do you know what? It's something that's probably been underplayed so far because of the way the rules have, have changed is the role of equipment. I mean, this, um, it was obviously one of the key factors in the 90s. You know, there was that spate of attempts on the record um, because um, positions were varied, bike materials were varied, um, the shape of the bike was varied. Um, now, broadly speaking, the bike should be fairly similar. However, you know, it's probably going to be 500 metres, a kilometre in it, maybe, between Bob Ridge and Dowsett. And, you know, some of the, the figures we heard quoted now about all the differences in terms of what the, you know, a skin suit can make, a bike can make, I think that will be absolutely key, certainly between those two guys. Um, and... 
Yeah. Looking. Well, interestingly, I, I spoke to Jim McFarlane of Endura, uh, who is the Movistar team sponsors, and they've been testing 150 materials, and they've now got 14 different skin suits, which uh, they're testing for, for the event. The bike was there as well, the Canyon low-profile bike, very, very nice-looking, very understated bike, which I think the presence of the bike, the presence of the people the press there really made Douse it suddenly dawned on him exactly what he's put himself up for and, and also we shouldn't take for granted that all of those riders are going to complete the hour I mean there have been um, various attempts in the past which have gone badly wrong which kind of shows as to what extent or, or how difficult it is as a, as a challenge I mean a man who I like to think would be a friend of the podcast Evgeny Burzin in 1997 tried in Bordeaux and he was a fading force at that time but I think he only managed 17 kilometres before he he got I'd like to see him take on Lionel for the tour record I think (laughs) Burzin and Lionel well I need to do a bit more Christmas eating to get up to Burzin he's got a head start on me on that that front Uh, he's a big chap these days Um, just you mentioned about the equipment and Canyon being fully behind um, Dowsett's hour record uh, attempt the uh, the equipment manufacturers are key in sort of driving this forward aren't they trek were fully behind jens voigt and instrumental in in um putting together his attempt and scott obviously got a lot out of Matthias brandley's attempt it's it is almost a kind of constructors drivers type uh, effort the equivalent to form a formula one type setup the, the equipment really is um, incredibly important as it was in the 90s it's slightly different it's not quite as space age and innovative looking if you see the espada bike that um, miguel indurain did the hour record on it looks like something even now it looks futuristic doesn't it 20 years on so the equipment side of it is is interesting um, but I think this kind of uh, Bobridge, Dennis, Dowsett, it's still in the kind of the B listers. That's not being dis- disrespectful to any of those riders, but we are we are moving towards the point where Bradley Wiggins, Tony Martin, perhaps Fabian Cancellara throw their hats into the ring. And I still think there's something to be done in terms of making the hour record um, a televisual spectacle. It's something I suggested um, in our live event that we did at the Velo House in Tunbridge Wells was if the broadcasters and the riders could get together and you could have. Uh, simultaneous hour record attempts taking place in two different velodromes riders will choose their velodrome based on a number of factors availability probably being the most important but also there are technical aspects some riders might want longer straights or shorter straights they might want the 250 track Um, Brandley set it at Aigler didn't he on a 200 meter track which is obviously shorter than 250 shorter than the standard so it'd be really good if two riders could get it together a bit like boxers it would be very hard to get the two people together um, to do it but to have two riders going for it in different velodromes at the same time that would make a real television type spectacle well needless to say Dowsett is taking it very very seriously he's got 27 hours block, blocked out at the track between now and February he's off to Mallorca uh, to spend Christmas alone on, on, in a training camp on his own he says that if he says otherwise it's two days of colossal eating and no training he says the quality street especially the purple ones he cannot resist them so he's going to be on his own the green triangles he likes the purple ones only two days of colossal eating Alex you're, a, you're an amateur missing out on an opportunity yeah, seven or eight days surely but yeah I mean it, you know it's there are a few you know for these guys as well somebody pointed out on Twitter the other day nobody's ever set the world hour record in February and one of the challenges is being in the condition to break their record in in February knowing that you've got a full road season ahead of you and he did I spoke to him afterwards and he said that he you know his team is obviously right behind him they've asked him what kind of program he wants this year the Tour de France is his big uh, he obviously was disappointed to miss out on selection for the tour this year but next year they've told him they want him in the Tour de France team where presumably he'll be supporting Nairo Quintana um, but you know he's taking it very very seriously I think the press conference the presence of the media there really hammered home to him just what a big thing he's put himself up for before we hear from Alex anything else to add Daniel to the our record no not really I mean Lionel mentioned colossal eating it's about time we got on with our colossal our marathon Christmas lunch, isn't it? But yeah, after, obviously, after we've we're going to have it. we're going to have a, a colossal lunch, maybe share a bottle of wine, and then come back for some more podcasting afterwards, which which will be fun. Mm-hmm. But Alex Dowsett <laughs> opened his press conference with a a, a speech, really uh, talking about you know why he's going for this world hour record. He spoke very uh, well, very eloquently about the reasons, and so we thought we'd play in full his um, his explanation. Here he is. Growing up with haemophilia is, um, 
it's difficult. I'd say it's more difficult for my parents than for me. You know, for my parents, it was um, there's no history of it in the family, so it was a real it was a real learning process for them, um, and quite scary as well. It's not. It is a rare condition. It's something that um, mum and dad had to learn about quite quickly. And it was, um, it was a gloomy outlook for them. There was talk of um, wheelchairs, crutches, being having joints replaced or fused in place because of internal bleeding problems. There, was, um, there wasn't really any, uh, any positive way of looking at it. So we set off and it was on a journey, I guess, and um, mum and dad, they, they cared for me extremely well. They took the doctor's advice down to the T every single time, and you know, the, all the predicted outcomes are a far cry from the Alex you see in front of you today. It's, um, you know, I think mum says if, if she'd known now, well, if she knew it was gonna turn out like this, she would worry less and wouldn't be pestering dad for a facelift. It's, um, it's, you know, it's it really was, a tough time for them and so during my off season I travelled around Europe and um, with the, it was the Miles for Haemophilia campaign to and the idea of, of it was quite simple just to spread awareness of haemophilia and to promote a healthy lifestyle what you do is you do a mile at least a mile of exercise upload it to the to the website and um, and that was that. It was, it was a very simple concept. And our aim was six and a half thousand miles. We actually achieved well over 15,000. So it was a big success. Um, and what I was doing was going to these countries and just telling my story, tell, saying how I got to, to where I am today. And I think I didn't realize that actually the, the amount of hope and inspiration that my story was given. Um, and that was... To have a mother of a haemophiliac from Portugal just come up and give you a hug just because of what you've done on a bicycle is, is difficult to put into words exactly the feelings that that gives you. And it, it far, to me, outweighed winning any bike race, any, any fast car I might be able to buy as a result of um, what I can do on a push bike. This, this to me, was much bigger than that. Um, so then I thought, what... What next? What more can we do? Because it's quite clear that the better I do on a bike, the more it's inspiring the haemophilia community and the rare disease community really as well. So I think the pure cycling fans are going to hate me for saying this, but the a race that starts on the outskirts of Paris and finishes in a small little town called Roubaix, the general public don't really know a whole lot about this. So, whereas something like the Commonwealth Games, which in the cycling community isn't the biggest race in the world, but that hits home to, to the general public much more. So, that's why I thought the hour record, because everyone understands a world record, and the whole concept of it, to put yourself on the line, go out there and attempt something that's going to be very difficult, I think is, is, some, is a message that actually goes out to the, the haemophilia and rare disease community quite strongly. So, I'm not, before, I mean the hour record is something I have always looked at, something that's always interested me, and it would have always been for me, but now it, it kind of isn't anymore. It's, um, I think that's what's given me a whole new, a whole new sense of drive as well, is I know the, what it's gonna do within the haemophilia community, the message it's gonna send out. So I'm not really doing this for, for me, I'm not. I'm doing this for any haemophiliac that spends their childhood being told that they can't play football, they can't play rugby, they can't do anything high risk. I'm doing it for anyone with rare diseases that gets told. It's basically, anyone that gets told they can't do something because of a, a limiting factor that is out of their control, and yet they'll go out and attempt it anyways, and really try and strive to do something. And my haemophilia is is the reason I'm here as a professional cyclist. I was, I was told the same as every other haemophiliac that rugby, boxing, football were not the wisest sports. Um, so I set out to find something I could do. And um, I think if I hadn't had haemophilia, I probably wouldn't have attempted to ride a bike. And it's the mentality that I have as well. And that mentality is the same in a lot of young haemophiliacs that I've met. 
is they're constantly being told what they can't do and you just get sick of it. And you just end up going out there and trying to prove what you can do. So that is, um, that's basically why we're attempting the perfect hour. And that's, you know, it's a much bigger picture than whether I break or fail at getting the record. It's not, obviously I'm gonna go out there, give it my absolute everything and hope that it's enough. But really, if it inspires one kid to go out and do something that they thought they couldn't do, then the event will be a success. Because that, at the end of the day, is uh, a much bigger picture for me. So, Alex, you, you mentioned earlier that Chris, Chris Boardman's uh, feet, their record, were some of an inspiration. But you must have been quite a young, sort of impressionable cycling fan when you watched those. I mean, how daunting is it to think you'll be trying to do the same thing? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, the whole thing is quite daunting, and as it's got bigger, it's it's got more daunting. But you know, I keep um, going back to the reasons why I'm doing this, and that's yeah. You know, it, it doesn't take the pressure off, but it just makes it. That I know why I'm doing this. I'm not. I'm not doing this for me. It's um, you know, once upon a time I would have gone for the hour record for me, but not anymore. Um, yeah, I know. I've seen in my own, seen with my own eyes that actually the help that my story gives. So that's that for me is far bigger. Um, I wasn't a big heroes guy, so it's uh, yeah for me. I saw Boardman doing it, and you know, it was great, and it was something that I thought would be right up my street um, at some point. But obviously, when you're that young, you don't dream of. Well, I didn't dream of being at this level. I just. I was the kind of guy who just kept chipping away and focus on the next target and then the next target. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's quite a position to be in. You're probably not going to give me a, an answer to this one, but do you, <laughs> do you have a, a distance in your mind of what you know what might be possible? Um, no, um, I don't. It's uh, I think. Thank you. Probably a lot will ride on how Jack and Rowan do. Um, so, yeah, that will be, I guess that will be our basis. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult, difficult thing to say because uh, the tests we've done have been for training purposes, not necessarily for to see what I'm capable of because at this we've still got a couple of months at this moment in time. Well, in two months I'll be capable of a lot more than what I am now. So, um, yeah, but I guess we will look at Rowan and Jack as, as references. I mean, your, your team has a heritage in their record, as, as you mentioned earlier, Miguel Indurain, yeah. 1994. Um, in, its, in its previous guise, did, when you went to the team with the idea, did you get a very enthusiastic response? Did they, did they buy into it because of that heritage, do you think? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I honestly don't know, but I'd have thought, you know, my movie star, I think whatever I say I want to achieve they they fully back it I mean I don't, I don't think there's many teams where you go to your team training camp and tell them what races you want to do this year and they they take that they really do take that into account so you know they're extremely supportive in whatever we choose so um, you yeah, know I'm great I'm so grateful to them and the sponsors um, you know, Canyon and Endura this yeah I, I knew if I wanted to have a go, they'd be in full support. I mean, do you have a... I guess it was the fittest you'll ever be in February. Um, do you have an idea at the moment of what your programme will look like beyond February? Um, it'll be aiming for the Tour de France again. And I... When I said to... Um, when we were asked what races we wanted to do, um, Zabio said to me he'd like me to... He'd like me there in that Tour de France team. And so I said, I want to be there as well. And I said, and you should, you and the team should decide exactly what you think the best approach is for it. So beyond um, after the hour record, I've I leave my race program completely in their hands because I, you know, I trust them to make the, trust them to give me the best race program and training program ahead of um, ahead of the record.
ahead so, of the tour, sorry. And, and just finally, Alex, um, you've been training on the on the London Velodrome a little bit. Is there anything about about that track in particular that makes it, you know, you've ridden on other tracks, they're all a little bit different. What, what are the unique characteristics of the London track? Um, <laughs> fortunately, I don't really know enough about tracks to be able to tell you precisely. I mean, the, the team looked into exactly how London fares against other tracks and it's you know it's quick um, you know it's the right sort of wood and stuff like that it's um, yeah, I, I suggested London because it's a home event I love London um, it's on the Essex side of London as well to me that made sense but they said to me well actually we'd rather you did it here because this track's faster than I'd be like yeah absolutely so um yeah, London. London seemed like my first logical, um, logical sort of place for it, and um, yeah, luckily everything fell into place with it. And just Christmas then is going to be. I mean, it's always probably a, a pretty uh, uh, <laughs> a time of denying yourself the usual Christmas treats, but you'll be off the mince pies completely, I guess, over Christmas. I'll be in Mallorca on my own <laughs> training. Um, it's. Uh, I've never done that before. Um, I think well, it, it's well, so. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Really I'm going on my own. Um, and it's. Um, yeah, it's, it's purely a self-motivated, self-funded training camp because. I just think you know it's something I need to do. You lose box Christmas Day, Boxing Day. You do lose two days training, um, and you do eat a colossal amount. If someone puts Quality Street in front of me. I will eat them, the purple ones mainly. Um, and so I, I just thought, you know, I owe it to the sponsors, the team, to myself and to you know, everyone that I'm doing this record for to give this 110% and at the end of the day in five years' time, if I still hold the record, or if I break it and then hold it, I'm not going to look back at that Christmas day I missed. So. What, what, I mean, there's going to be a few attempts in our record this year, I think. You know, Bradley Wiggins is going for it in June. Yeah. Um, any idea what, what what kind of mark it will be by the end of this time next year? No idea. haven't a clue. It's, um, no, for sure, Wiggins is going to be fast. Jack and Rowan are going to be fast. I hope I can be fast. It's uh, I mean, Tony Martin and Cancellara... They've been talking about it for a couple of years. It'd be nice if one of them had a crack, I think. Um, million dollar question, that, yeah, yeah, where yeah, is yeah. it going to be? This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Free. We're post-lunch. Uh, Lionel's looking like a country squire, uh, all dressed up in a tweed and uh, hat uh, ensemble. Looking, looking, looking good, Lionel. Enjoy lunch. Lovely lunch, very nice lunch, yeah. Uh, tapas, um, it's like uh, it's selections of things from Spain. Yeah, that's pretty much what tapas is. We've been joined by Rob Hatch. Hello, Rob. Hello again. Um, and we're just going to wrap things up really quickly. This isn't going to go on for too long, don't worry. This is our kind of end of year show uh, opportunity for us to say thank you very much, everybody, for listening, to give you a little hint about our plans for 2015. But we're going to go, go through everybody and get you to nominate a highlight for the year, really. Lionel, can we start with you? What was your highlight 2014? Um, well, I'll start at the start of the year. My highlight was probably uh, the week at Paris Nice. I went to Paris Nice for the podcast, um, had a very enjoyable time there. It was almost like a holiday, really. It was, uh, it was great just to observe the racing and talk to people and try and get a flavour of that into uh, an episode of the podcast and just very relaxed week. Um, the race I got a good. nice interview with Tom Boonan there about Pyra Bay, I remember. Did have a very nice interview with Tom Boonan. Yeah, Tom Boonan, uh, if you want to try and talk to him at Pyra Bay or the Tour of Flanders, very unlikely to get more than uh, more than a... Well, very unlikely to get anything from him. But mm. at Pyra Nice, he was, he was very relaxed. We had a good long chat for 10, 15 minutes and he gave his whole, uh, you know, sort of Pyra Roubaix life story. It was great. And that podcast, of course, is still available for people to listen to if they want to go back and listen to our Pyro Bay special podcast. We did a special just before Pyro Bay, didn't we, where we really, it was a general preview, but also uh, a show about the race. 
Well, all of our podcasts are available for people to listen to. Um, you can go back on audioboom.com and search for The Cycling Podcast or go to thecyclingpodcast.com. A whole year's output is available for people to listen to over the Christmas period. <laughs> I'd, um, I'd point them in the direction of the Paris-Nice special, the Paris-Roubaix special, which was an excellent uh, look at... Look at Paris Roubaix, uh, the Cobble Classic. Um, the episodes from Belfast and the Giro d'Italia, our entire Tour de France oeuvre, and uh, also my trip to the Ghent Six. They're my particular highlights. Lionel, did you have quite a lot of weight in that lunch? Yes. <laughs> Dan- Daniel, Daniel, what was your highlight of the year? Well, it's been a trying year. Um... <laughs> we're, not talking, we're talking about professional uh, stuff here to keep it to cycling yeah that's what, that's what I meant um, anyway um, yeah, I, I think I mentioned this at our live event the other day my almost daily interactions now with our good friend very very good friend more than a friend of the podcast I think almost um, how would you describe Chiros con he is he's one of our kin isn't he yeah. um, anyway my almost daily interaction with, with Chiro that's been a delight um you know, the kind of Duracell bunny of the press room, just watching him in action every day at the tour in particular. Um, you know, as I said the other day at the, our live event, you will see cheering the, the unlikeliest poses, kind of tapping out his copy, kind of hanging like a fruit bat from, you know, under the desk, uh, on top of the desk. Um, anything he needs to do to be able to file his copy for the La Gazette Little Sport and participate in the podcast at the same time. Um, and um, I think that was my highlight. You know, me and Chiro... You know, really feel you. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, Rob's looking slightly threatened by this because <laughs> you, and, you and Rob, of course, are uh, our housemates now, so there's a bit of a, a menage a trois going on. Lionel, were you going to say something there? Well, I was just going to say, you were talking about uh, Chiro being the Duracell bunny of the press room, and when you said about um, about him darting here and there like a like some kind of fruit bat, I yeah. don't know whether they're renowned for their energetic behaviour. Well, but the funny, funny thing is, Chiro and I have this strange... This is maybe going a bit, this is giving too much away, but Chiro and I have this strange... <laughs> remember earlier in the year we talked about how um, I'd previously filed um, ex-girlfriends under the names of Tour de France King of the Mountains in my phone. Well, Chira and I have a very strange ritual whereby we call it to the by animal animal net every time <laughs> Chira and I speak. So one in one conversation, Chira will be the bat. In another conversation, it'll be the it'll be the antelope, and, and vice versa. So you you know you, well, call, <laughs> you called him you called him. I liken him to a fruit bat. Or, you know, at times I do call him the pipistrello, the bat. <laughs> I was just going to say that our very good colleague from Australia, Rupert Guinness, is kind of the sloth of the press room, not yeah. unknown to have a glass of rosé in the afternoon during the hot afternoon on the tour and, and actually sleep under the desk. Yeah, I've um, got a picture of him sleeping under the desk <laughs> in the press room. Yeah, I've, I've not I've not quite reached that level yet. I you know I will have an afternoon rosé, but uh, I've not yet fallen asleep in the press room. Well, my that brings me to my highlight of the year was probably spilling rosé on my keyboard during the Tour de France. <laughs> not so much the incident itself, but more the fact that it was captured in all its glory on one podcast, I think Saint Etienne, wasn't it? Where we I foolishly placed a, a plastic tumbler of rosé beside my computer on a very windy day in Saint Etienne, and it blew across my. And that was captured memorably on the podcast, which was enjoyable. I should, should just say that um, we, we don't just sort of drink wantonly on the tour, but part of the whole thing with the Tour de France press rooms, they, they, they are uh, generally, as Daniel's often said, they're in schools or in um, um, sports arenas or in um, Hotel de Ville or wherever they happen to be. But the, the, the hospitality, the lunch, the buffet is put on by the local region and often they will showcase their wines, um, they'll showcase the best of their food, food some are better than others a, a good buffet can really make a day on the tour um, but often there'll be a, a glass of a glass of a glass of, uh, a, of cold rosé or, or white wine and uh, you know it's nice to sample the the, the various uh, the various wines as we go around France it's a great so we, accompaniment we, with yeah. a keyboard yeah. um, <laughs> my my highlight I've got to say stage five of the Tour de France Yorkshire I think Yorkshire was a terrific few, uh, two days um, and uh, driving a Jaguar around the tour was pretty nice as well. We were fortunate enough to be sponsored by Jaguar. Thanks again, Jaguar, for the uh, sponsorship during the tour. Maybe I'll talk again in the new year, chaps. Um, but that was that was fun. Um, and, yeah, the tour was enjoyable, actually. Really enjoyed the tour. This was the second 
tour. This was the first year we went, I think, Lionel and I especially, and Daniel, uh, with the podcast as a real, the thing that we were there to do. Making and it was, it was, it was, it was making history. It was, it was, it was great fun. The first ever podcast to be fully accredited on Tour de France, weren't we? We were making history. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true, Daniel. But um, we, you know, that, that was great fun. It brings us on, before I just come to Rob, to our plans for next year, because we will be back in the new year. January the 19th, we should be reconvening. Podcast should appear within a few days of that uh, we'll have a new sound a new feel uh, we're committed for next year and we'll have an exciting announcement I think for that first podcast in January the 19th so please tune in for that Rob maybe you'll be a regular with us next year as well depending on other work commitments uh, but when he throws me out of the house or not yeah um, what was your highlight of the year this year um, without wanting to give as a Lancastrian Yorkshire any more publicity than it deserves yes I would Tour de France was fantastic, of course, absolutely wonderful. I think we all enjoyed it. But a little bit as the forgotten moment, I think, of the, the cycling season this year. And, and it was again over here on these islands, Giro d'Italia, my favourite race. From a personal point of view, it was the first time in three years that I'd been back there. Absolutely loved the race. And I mean, your first it, time in Ireland, I think, wasn't it? First it? time in Ireland as well. Yeah. Bizarrely, I've been lucky enough to travel all over, never been to Ireland. Uh, really enjoyed Belfast. Fantastic, fantastic hospitality and everything, and, and not just the press rooms this time. Walking down with with the great Sean Kelly after the commentary back towards the pubs, and you know we were stopped every 15 meters by people, even less. You know, Sean, what a hero! Come and have a chat, and you know he'd gone sign something, and we we talk about cycling history and what have you, and hiding in the corner of a pub. So. You know, there's so many people in there. It was absolutely brilliant. Superb atmosphere. And Belfast, certainly more so than Dublin, I have to say. Dublin was, mm. it felt like, a bit like the London stage of the tour. It was sort yeah. of a bit of an afterthought. Belfast, the first two days, were absolutely wonderful. And, and again, just every little village on that north east coast, painted pink, and you've pink balloons everywhere. It was beautiful, beautiful. Lovely. It was amazing, actually. It is almost forgotten, isn't it? And it, the, I mean, terrible weather, shocking weather. But the people of Northern Ireland especially um, really went to town and it was it was the, 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 the whole country was painted pink wasn't it? Yeah I know Daniel enjoyed it particularly but uh, my memory is uh, my memory is getting into a taxi and uh, obviously it's a city divided by sort of sectarian differences and uh, the taxi driver said oh there's no green there's no orange this weekend everything is pink and uh, I think that was you know major sporting events do bring communities together and I think that was one of the one of the finest things to see in Belfast. Absolutely. Anything else to add, chaps, to our end of end of year wrap up, or are we going to go for one for the road? Let's have another beer, shall we? All right. Well, listen. Thank you, everybody, for listening this year. Um, we're very grateful to you for listening. We should say thanks to uh, Nigel Brown, who's been helping us this year, uh, to Paul Scoynes and uh, John Mooney, who've been our producers, editors, and have done a, a cracking job. Uh, also, thanks to Jaguar for their sponsorship during the Tour de France. Much appreciated. Um, and we'll see you all again in 2015. We've done a few live events recently. Got a few more coming up in 2015 as well. And thanks very much to people who have hosted us for live events. We're, we're open to offers. We'll tour. We'll go anywhere, won't we, chaps? Yep. Belfast, maybe? That could be on our itinerary I, next I mean, year. I if we go to Belfast, definitely. Yeah, Rob yeah. can join us in Belfast. OK, well, thank you, Rob, for joining us, and, and hopefully you'll be able to join us again in the new year. Thank you very much. It's been good fun. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Daniel. Speechless. Thank you. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast. OK, a special <laughs> bonus feature. End of... Uh, end of the year podcast I'm joined by Ellis Bacon here who for the fifth volume of the Cycling Anthology he's a co-editor of the Cycling Anthology with Lionel Burney and for the fifth edition he wrote a, a, a quite a long poem about the Tour de France the 2014 Tour de France and Ellis is going to perform the poem I don't think read is the right <laughs> word he's going to perform the poem for us now as a special Christmas treat Ellis take it away in fair Yorkshire, where our scene begins, neat sunny skies, towns bathed in grins, 200 men line up their wheels, off on their way to shouts and squeals. Leeds, Harrogate, York, Sheffield, steel, yourself against what now is real. Three weeks ahead, three weeks to fear, remember well this start, Yorkshire. With Royal Wave, the Grand Depart, 
To Harrogate we make our start, to the brawling mauling of a flying finish, up for grabs though the British wish that one in particular who has his eye on victory, a cherished prize, can make it his, can make a play, but he is not to be the son of Harrogate today. They are clattered down by his own hand, in take of breath across the land, amidst the crowd a mother weeps, the sun doth sink and the sun sleeps, and the day is done. Up with the sun, but the sun's undone, his path is ended here. But let the race march on, march on, march on. There's much on the menu, fear, blubber houses, Greekland, moss, Midhope stones, Outerbridge, renamed Cot, and wait. Wait, wait, and go on the Jenkin Road where the seed is sown, fair Italy comes afore, a flash of blue and tricolor exchanged soon for yellow. Now the only way is Essex, my boys, and on to the capital. Through driving rain to the palace, maul, maul, and it's here that sprinter reigns once more. Return to France where the children play and the grand mare bicker and grin and the old men listen on the wireless. Huge ears press close and they're coming. Here they come, shrieks someone, and they're right. First the swish swish of the whirlybird blades, then the roar of the pre-show motors, then the quietude. Are they late? It's time, are they late? It's time. Behold a torrent of silver and gold and colour and light and sound and wind. What wonderful whistling and it all begins and it's over so fast, as they say. Yet it lingers, a French memory, once every few years. One hundred years since death of men, at Menin we will remember them. And for now we will remember too how our champion fallen struggles through. Falls once too many, enough the call, a wrist, a risk, he'll end it all. Enough, this time it's gone too far, dismounts, remounts the waiting car. And for the rest, those terrible stones, the sound of rattling knuckle bones, a personal sound amid the din, then boom, the sound of a well-won win. A worthy champion every day displays panache to win the stage. They lay it on the line, no guts, no glory, no long-haul plan, a short-term story. Mais le voilà, the French en tête, long overdue lest we forget. They're one year shy of thirty years since badger time and joyful tears. And they come, brown-shorted cavalry, they come led first by cadre and provide in white the gaming French. A Pinot Blanc, what sweet revenge post decades lived in tedium de Francais sur le podium let's thrill our friend conquistador whose bastille crash ends his onslaught his russian danish spanish armada left rudderless their race now harder without a goal without a head left now behind on the road he bled and another day is done the bunch sprint thunders buffalo Torn brand of brothers, each the same goal, squeezing through gaps, unopened doors, and I've finally done it, a Viking roars. Back home, I hope they'll party. What, like it's 1999? Ha, the first of the winnerless tours. Damn spot, blight of our time. The mountains, and en route to summits, in huddled groups, the watchers wait. It's here the riders creep quite slow. On melting roads, stars of the show, toil over barren, burned wasteland, accursed watchers close at hand. In coloured cloth, performing clowns, water squirted, gurns abound. This mask of pain, this face adores, adorns, <laughs> soundtracked by the diddle little 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 of comedy car horns. Ah, the Italian, yellow peril, campione. What hope do the others have now? The podium? First loser. Slow down, Italian. Don't you know what they'll ask you? But were the others still here, they'd have gone even faster. Need us as much time as I could get, he cried. You've done that, mate. You've done that all right. Twixt Alps and Pyrenees, respite of sorts at least. Continued fight. Gladiators all bound for Nîmes. Arena finish to stage 15. Fast man from Norway, first again. Grabbed at the expense of a Kiwi win. Two dozen metres short, pulled back. A classy try, that long attack. They lay their heads in carcass on. One day's repose, then they're gone. A solo feat, Australian, in the spa town, Bannière de Luchon. O Tourmalet, O Holtecam, a win confirmed for the shark who came from Messina seeking victory and sealed the deal in the Pyrenees. Water, water everywhere, redemption flowing in. In Bergerac, a lone attack succeeds and takes the win. The Kiwi loss in that Neem town, redeemed by one, Auslitown. 
upon Paris's Grand Avenue, the fairer sex descend, and followed soon on laps the same, weakened men attend. Triumphant arc, a battle won, this final search, and then it's done. Das Sprinter, Elise King again, the fastest finisher, the best of men, who, exhausted now, collapsed with beers, and loved ones, crying, claps and cheers. So to the winners, the bulging purse, best sprinter, best climber, third, second, first. In summertime Paris, endeth our poem, three weeks completed, and the crowds head home, and the day is done.